Hi, I want to take a few minutes to summarize and update what's been going on in my family court case. Uh, it's been six years since I've seen my two children, Jazz and Maya. December 3rd, 2008 was the last time that I set eyes on my children. I talk to them every other night for 10 minutes if they answer the phone, if they answer the phone. And it's regarding a permanent restraining order that's been put on me for no reason whatsoever. The unfortunate thing about my story is that it's synonymous with many parents across our nation, mostly fathers, some mothers, yes, mostly fathers who are being stripped from their parental duties, who, which they so care to give and apply. It's, it's stripping children from these parents who would like to give them. It's a two-way street. It's criminal on both angles, constitutionally. God-given natural rights are being stripped and thrown into the trash. You could take several names of fathers that I know, put them right into my case, and they would fit almost like a, like a team. So, what I'm gonna take time to do is summarize and condense six years of court ineptitude that, have, that has enabled a selfish parent to get away with what is nothing short of kidnapping and what the courts have done is nothing short of cruel and unusual punishment and in violation of many constitutional issues, many constitutional rights. And it boils down to basic treason if you want to get really serious. And if our constitution is in the trash, it's time to get it out of the trash. So I'm going to take a moment to bullet point six years problematic decision making by a courthouse what has, which has led to a father having zero relationship, zero parental rights without formally having stripping a human being of these actual parenting rights. 2007, I basically have full custody of my two children. I have them 85% of the time. They visit their mom Tuesday and Thursday. They visit their mom every other weekend. No overnights. There's a problem. My daughter has identified the live-in boyfriend as having improperly touched her. She's having problems holding her bladder. My son is having problems with his visits to the bathroom. These are both highly problematic to me. And unfortunately, DCSF and the courts are unable to substantiate anything. Commissioner David J. Cowan at the time finds no emergency. I apply the knowledge of a babysitter that has six pages of criminal record. That doesn't seem to make a problem, make a, uh, that doesn't seem to bring to light uh, any light to this problem at all. So uh, I'm running into dead ends with all of this going on around my kids. I decide to take my kids to counseling that's offered free with their school. This counseling move by me, which was to the benefit of my children, cost me contempt charges that took me four months to get over because I wanted to give my children a voice to someone who could put a finger on what was going on in the house they were living in when they were visiting. So after the contempt charges were dismissed and my ex finally decided to say, oh, okay, you can take them to counseling. I'm formally given by her custody of our children. So not only do I have custody, she gives me custody in writing. Only in 2008, two months later, to have the custody reversed with all the problems. Amy Neiman, court appointed minors counsel, comes into play and does a hatchet job on everything that I've done as a parent. I am quoted of say, as I am. Uh, perceived to have love for my children that comes out of the hate of my ex. These were Amy Neiman's words, not mine. Mr. Duval's love for his children seems to come out of the hatred for he has for his wife. This cost me the relationship with my children. And this wasn't the, the end of Miss Neiman's wrath in my case or several others find out more about Amy Neiman online if you just blog her name.
Google her name. So, Amy and, and my ex decide that getting me out of the kids' lives, along with Roy Kite, their attorney, that it's time for Damon to get out of the kids' lives. The mother's wish, the minor's counsel's wish, the lawyer's wish, and the David J. Cowan's wish. So Damon versus four people to parent his children is now the game. And at spring break in 2008, the kids disappear. I lose my kids. I am, not dis I am not consulted. They don't have my consent to change schools. The kids are gone. Not only do I not have custody any anymore, the kids are removed from school and down, taken down to El Segundo without a proper hearing. At that proper hearing, it's, it's all okay. Joint legal custody, joint legal custody is not an issue. Just take the kids. My ex goes on to say, that her attorney advised her. She is silenced by David J. Cowan, is not allowed to admit that her attorney advised her to break the law. And it goes right by the wayside. Now the kids are gone. My, my daughter does not finish preschool. My son gets put into a strange room for the last eight weeks of school and does not finish first grade properly. During this spring break, I tell Amy Neiman that what she has done is talk to my ex and done it on their own. And Amy L. Neiman tells me on the phone, and this is a quote, this is what Amy L. Neiman tells me. Don't you dare tell Cowan that we did that. Right, Amy, we, won't want to, we don't want to tell the judge or the commissioner that you just violated your position as a minor's counsel. We don't want to do that. We need to protect Amy Neiman, don't we? David Cowan at this time attempts to say that I've been not feeding my children, and in a sense starving my children. He goes on to state that although these healthy foods that I feed my children are not are something that I might like, but aren't something my children might like. So David Cowan is telling me how to feed my children and what to feed my children. What am I supposed to feed them? Ice cream and candy the whole time, Mr. Cowan? Is that what you do? Just give them junk food? When Cowan was asked if he was a father, he turned beet red and shriveled like a turtle inside of his shell right on the right on the bench as I stated they were kidnapped right here after the spring break the counseling with st. John's Development Health Center continued dr. Michelle Harriman unable to do anything but put toys on the ground and play on her computer when I told her my son was still having trouble with uh, certain areas of his life she because my son told me he was her response to me was now this is dr. Michelle Harriman at st. John's Child Development Center when I told her my son is still having these problems she yells at me and says how do you know this well miss Harriman dr. Harriman I know this because my son told me Perhaps if you had a conversation with my children during those few months, they might have told you something too. Now the restraining orders start, 2008. They mention a gun being hidden, or I think he's harboring one, I think he's gonna use one, I think he's gonna snap, and the restraining order starts. And it basically started because my ex told a fake story to a policeman who wasn't there in El Segundo and brought a report to the to the courtroom and started a restraining order and we all know they're getting they're handed out like candy anyway so I figured well if this is going to be a six month restraining order it'll be over in six months and we'll get this done with. so I, I comply with the restraining order for six months and they decided to renew it for a year in December of 2008
which is wrong because they can only renew it for five years or permanently. So this is starting David J. Cowan's uh, arbitration from the bench. He's going to renew re restraining orders as he wishes, not by statute, which is arbitrarily enforcing a law by himself from the bench. Excuse me. In 2008, I started a protest out in front of the courthouse after this restraining order had started because now I'd been renewed for a year with no evidence, no signs of an unfit parent, no threat to anybody. And here, I just had full custody the year before this, given to me by my ex, and now I've got a restraining order. My protest started which was to go on for about two years. During that protest, which started again in the beginning of 2009, I get hit on my bicycle. I have since lost the use of the majority use of my knee, the majority use of my back, my neck, and it's been an ongoing problem for the last five years. Dr. William Wershing in 2009 who is well aware of what's going on, has taken two psych evaluations of me, decides to appear in court for me. Dr. Wershing, on his own, not being paid, on his own merits as, a, as an officer and a gentleman and a, and a father himself, comes to court to clear the air for the court to say that Damon is no threat to anybody and he's more than fit and capable to parent at the level. Dr. Wershing is his testimony is twisted and he's basically run out of the courtroom by David J. Cowan himself and he apologizes for him not being able to help me and he didn't know his quote was these people operate in a different world so with his blessings and his apologies he left and everything stayed the same I then went to get the counseling they wanted to. After Dr. Wershing's psych evaluations didn't cover what the court wanted, I went to get the counseling they requested. The, the counseling they requested, I couldn't afford. They said they'd call me when the sliding scale hours would be available, which they never did. Time went by, I ended up finding my own counselor. I went through La Vie Counseling in Santa Monica. They in turn referred me to Dr. Jack Sher. I started counseling with Dr. Jack Sher and finished that later in 2012. But back to 2009, we're not done with the restraining orders. In 2009, the restraining order was, was renewed for one week and then for one year, both outside of statute, both arbitrarily issued by, by uh, David J. Cowan and both, unbeknownst to me, it was outside of statute and illegally done. And when you don't know the law, you're going to stand there and wonder what's happening. And when you take the time to go to the library and read up on what they've just done, you realize these are treasonous acts, unconstitutional treasonous acts against a natural family. And it's only 2009. So I've had the restraining order renewed for one week and one year. My protests out in front still continue. 2010 starts. I'm hit again by a, uh, on my bicycle. So my injuries compound. My parenting time is stripped. My, which isn't poor me, poor me. It's just that it's a fact. And these are the issues that are starting to compound on a court that's running away with my two children, enabling the capture and kidnapping of my two children. In 2010, I decided it's time to disqualify David J. Cowan from my case. Every attempt I could make was, was thwarted. He would answer them incorrectly. He, I, would, I attempted to uh, 
to call him on these shots. He was supposed to answer a certain way when you ask a question a certain way, and he just pushed everything by the wayside. So they're doing what they want. They're not, doing by, they're not playing by the rules, and I'm still not seeing my kids. Everything underneath my friend's house, my signs and my photos of my kids were stolen at this time. I don't know who did this, but somebody who worked in the courthouse said, you might want to check David J. Cowan's back room. That's what someone who worked in the courthouse told me. You might want to take, check David J. Cowan's chambers for your kids' pictures and your signs. So I made two new signs that were just as fitting, if not more appropriate. I went then to the FBI to call, to let them know that this is a form of domestic terrorism, that they've got a sworn oath to take care of their citizens and protect them from enemies, foreign and domestic. And this is domestic terrorism. The poor kid, the FBI agent behind the glass, kept telling me, you need a lawyer, sir. You need a lawyer, sir. And I said, no. I need the FBI to investigate a federal investigation on the destruction of a family that's going on right in front of them. No help. September, I started a civil case in a separate courtroom against my ex and what they were doing. And a uh, criminal civil case in a separate courtroom and a, a family court contempt hearing over 100 counts, of, 100 counts of not letting me talk to my kids, which was a court order. The 100 counts of contempt were dismissed as hearsay because my phone records to my ex's phone for the kids, one phone to one phone, all of my phone records were declared hearsay. The civil case that I started in a, different, in a separate courtroom, all valid measures, it survived a year, demurs, and once the interrogatories and once the subpoenas got started, the case was dismissed. And I do believe that this was involved uh, by the involvement of one Alan Seltzer, the husband of my minor's counsel, Amy Neiman, who's also deputy city attorney here in Santa Monica, who threatened me in open court in a separate courtroom that he told me, it's not going to be nice that you've met me. My case was dismissed about a month later in a Santa Monica civil court. Do I have evidence? No. But it was three months away from a jury trial and I was subpoenaing his wife's phone records and it was dismissed. You tell me. The year is up now, it's December 2010. I have my ex on the stand. I am asking her, this is the first time I've talked to her in two and a half years. I have her on the stand. I ask her, is this not the first time that I've spoken to you in two and a half years? She says, that's true. I said, I have not talked to you, been near you, done anything, anything, no interaction between me and you. In, in, I'm summarizing the question, and she agrees that there's nothing that I've done. Then I said, but you've checked the box here, that I constantly harass you. And she says, you harass me through the court process. And I'm, well, if I'm not talking to my children half the time, I'm going to file documents stating that to the fact. It's my right to have a court order maintained, is it not? And these are the only contacts I'm having with her is her inability to conform to a court order. Yet, David J. Cowan finds my filing documents, my First Amendment right to petition the court, he finds these to be contact and renews the restraining order for three more years for petitioning the court to uphold a court order. Three more years away from my kid with both of my kids, our kids, my exes and my kids. So now I've got a three-year, outside of statute again, five years or permanent, that's the only, the 
California statute in the family code says a restraining order can only be renewed five years or permanent. Now we've had it for one year, one week, one year, and now three years. Four renewals outside of statute. And I walk out of the courtroom wondering, again, now mind you, I've just been hit by a car twice, I'm living bad, and I'm just about to have surgeries, and I'm wondering <laughs> what more can happen. Three more years of a restraining order. And it's 2010. 2011, I have my surgeries. I have a knee replacement. I have neck surgery. And I'm back in court 12 days out of surgery. And I can't find the document that I filed for the moving papers to uh, continue. Uh, these were uh, papers to start visitation again requesting please let me see my kids and because I couldn't find the document I filed and I'm reminding the court that I'm 12 days out of surgery David Cowan says if you don't have the paperwork you filed we're gonna dismiss it and I said David Cowan your honor the paperwork I filed was done on the 13th of this month it should be right on top of the file it's the last thing that's everything in the file goes right on top that's been most recently done he refuses to look at the document, dismisses my motion, and fines me $900. Fact. So, most of 2011 ends up with just that, recovery time from surgery and being fined for the last thing I filed. <laughs> 2012, the civil case gets dismissed. As I mentioned before, probably through Alan Selfie's recommendation. I appealed it, and although that I was found to have done it correctly, the civil court says because we are bound to go with the judge's original decision, we're gonna uphold the dismissal. Amy Neiman at the meantime, in the meantime, has been using my name in other court hearings in a negative light. I brought conflict of interest papers stating that she is mentioning my name in a negative light in other hearings, in other pleadings, and her answer to David J. Cowan was, how could, I, how could I possibly hold this against Mr. Duval? She was asked, is there a conflict of interest, Ms. Neiman? Oh, no, Your Honor. A simple question gets Amy off the hook. Even at the court, yet the professional rules of conduct state, even if there is the hint of a possibility of a conflict of interest, a lawyer must recuse themselves. If there is a hint or the potential for a conflict of interest. They must recuse themselves. So her filing negative comments about me in other court hearings, no conflict of interest there. 2013 is the year David J. Callen leaves the family court and is removed and taken down to probate court. So I end up with a different judge, a new, basically a new venue, downtown Bruce Iwasaki presiding. My restraining order is done. It's now been renewals of one year, one week, one year, three years, and now they're back to renew it permanently. And I go before the court in September, in November of 2013, asserting the restraining order as void, as they've renewed it outside of statute four separate times, and that the order is void and my ex needs to start over with no restraining order and start over. Even though they had three more weeks until the restraining order was, was actually over, they could have had a second hearing and brought forth the new 
findings. But instead, they wouldn't assert it void. They let David J. Cowan's rulings stand outside of statute. And they found that my going to the children's school after school had let out to pick up their grades to see how they've done for the year, this is a reason to give me a permanent restraining order because I went to the school. The school is listed on the restraining order, yes, but when school is out for summer, nobody's there. It's arguably not even a school. So by me waiting till school was out to pick up their grades, who the school asked me to come by and sign a waiver to pick up their grades, I'm found as in violation of a restraining order, and now it's permanent. I have a permanent restraining order for the rest of my life because I went to a school and picked up my children's grades. Fact. That's it. So Bruce Iwasaki continues the maligned, malicious, if the lie is big enough, nobody will believe it kind of attitude. And if they've been this wrong for this long, I don't think they're going to admit guilt. So they're just going to continue to make me the bad guy. And we'll find out what happens in the long run. My kids are now 13 and 11 years old. They haven't seen their father in six years. They are not present when I call them on the phone. This will be my sixth Christmas in a row that I don't see them. Six Thanksgiving, six Father's Day, all of that, with no relationship with my wonderful two children that I had raised so beautifully for the first five years. So the permanent restraining order is now an order. It's under appeal as we speak. I file a request for order right after that to start visitation as I have now completed all of the counseling that the court has asked of me. I have seen Dr. Scher for over a year. I have letters stating to that effect. I sign that I put them into a document. I sign them under penalty of perjury that they are true and correct and they state that I've completed all of the court ordered counseling. Amy Neiman was notified of this doctor did not contest it, and I finished it. The doctor's letters were, like my phone records, were declared hearsay, and my motion was dismissed as being without merit. So even if I do the right thing, even if I go to the counseling, present the doctor's letters, I'm still wrong. And that's where we stand right now in 2014. Having completed, watching all of this happen, my son and daughter's abuse, the restraining orders being renewed at their whim, the kidnapping of my children out of the schools, outside of joint legal agreement, Amy Neiman's conflict of interest, not, let, not let, getting her off the hook, she continues to get $125,000 a year per case from the county. So to get up to speed, here we are in 2014. I have a denied motion to see my kids, although I have completed everything they've asked of me. And I've been threatened with vexatious litigation if I file a document again like that. How can I be, I ask, the universe, how can I be vexatious, frivolous, which means wasting the court's time by just filing a completion of a court order. All I'm doing is letting the court know that I've done everything they wanted, yet I'm threatened with vexatious litigant status, which is a lifetime tattoo to file anything with the court. It restricts your, petition, your petitioning ability to the court in a major way, and they, they've threatened They've threatened me out of the courthouse. So I sit here without a relationship with my two children, fighting for six years, with two appeals pending, and hoping that God Almighty might have a say in these abusive acts against two defenseless children that happened not only to me, but to countless other people across this nation.
every single day. And something has to stop. It's absolutely out of freaking control. I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas. Happy New Year coming up. And I'll pray some more, like I do every night, that reunification with my children will happen sooner than it does later. Thanks.